Hello, and welcome to the first visual episode of the Katie and Sigrid Show. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to talk about some of our historical trips to Winchester today. And Manassas. And Manassas. But starting off with Winchester, so that's why I put it first. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll let you kick it off, um, and then I'll, I'll jump in as you... Uh, yes. I'll let you introduce the topic. We spent a couple weekends in Winchester, Virginia, which isn't too far from where we live. And um, we visited some various historical sites there. One of the sites that we went to was the Sh- uh, Shenandoah Valley Civil War Museum, which was really cool. We had a bunch of artifacts from the Civil War, like had a bunch of them, like bullets and mm. other military weapons. And there was a, the drawings on the walls of the museum because it used to be a, well, previously it was a courthouse and it was used to hold prisoners of war for actually for both sides at various times during the Civil War. And one of them, one of the uh, people that was a prisoner of war there, assumably someone who's from the Union, wrote a uh, poem called The Curse to Jefferson Davis, which was very interesting. He was like all the stuff that he wanted Jeff Davis to go through. So Yeah, it was basically, uh, he wanted him to... Um... I don't remember the whole part of it, but part of it was he wanted him to be eaten by, like, a, a shark or a whale that was then, like, taken to hell, and then he'd be left on, like, an island where it's always windy and sandy, um, and basically just suffer for eternity. Um, the important thing to, to know and, and understand about Winchester is it traded hands between the Union and Confederates multiple times a day, most of the time, um, for a long period of time. It was pretty rough for those people, because, like... You know, one day you've got uh, yeah. the side that you support, which in this case, most people in Winchester at the time support the Confederacy. So they were mostly more comfortable when those when the Confederates were there. But occasionally the Union would come in and occupy the town. Um, they had mentioned that a lot of the times it was very much like day to day, even day to day, like the Union soldiers marched through town today or like the Union soldiers put up camps in the town for a little bit and then decided to leave after a couple hours and then Confederates were here for a week or whatever, right? Or a couple days yeah. um, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and like it was very disruptive to trade and, and all that, of course, and like just the daily lives of these people because like, like I said, you support one side, you're more comfortable when their troops are there, when the other side comes up, you're not terribly comfortable. Um, and throughout the multiple battles that happened at Winchester, both sides took prisoners of war. Um, and eventually, the courthouse was retooled as an actual little prison, and um, the Union at that time had control of the town, and they put a bunch of Confederate soldiers out there, and a couple in the courthouse itself, and there was some graffiti um, that a Confederate soldier had done of some Union soldiers that was very unflattering. It looked like um, some kind of animal... It wasn't immediately clear based on the graffiti, but I think they're trying to go for like a pig or something similar. And yeah, then... pig. But if it wasn't a pig, it was a horse. Right. It it was hard to say. It was, it was between those two animals. The point was, it was not a very flattering image. Yeah, there was a uh, uh, little kid, probably like two or three, that was convinced it was an elephant. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because they also had some other graffiti, uh, that was reproduced in and some of it that was still there. Um, and their little museum in the upstairs of the courthouse, and they talked about how, you know, of course, since we had Confederates and Union soldiers here, like, there are varying themes in the graffiti, right? Most of them are very, uh, like, the one against Jefferson Davis are very harsh. Yeah. Um, and then some of them were significantly less harsh. It was very interesting to see the graffiti, because, like, um, I think one of them was, like, someone had signed their name or something, so I was like, if they added more, we don't have it, but, like, from what we can tell, like, this person just signed their name. So it was interesting to see the the, the difference of, like, the intention of the graffiti and, and how detailed it was. Um, the other interesting thing was, uh, I can't remember exactly... Oh, I got it. Okay, so the courthouse, their, their claim to fame uh, was that their judge or a judge that was happened to be at the courthouse um, who was stationed there um, at some point had previously worked um, or not previously. I think he was still working as the, uh, what's it called? The judge for the uh, John Brown case. Because like at the time, like the judges would ride around to like different courthouses and as necessary and judge cases there. And, right. He, yeah. he was like a big wig ju- judge though. 
Yeah, I don't remember the official, his official title. But. Right, but like the point is, like he he was responsible for multiple towns, so he would travel back and forth. And yeah, he uh, did they he traveled. Where did he go for the John Brown trial? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head where the John Brown trial okay. was. I want to say it was Harper's. Well, I know it was the whole raid was in Harper's Ferry. I can't remember if the um, trial was in Harper's Ferry or they moved it somewhere else. Right. So, uh, quick, one second. I need to. My uh, charger fell out. Oh, I don't want this to die in the middle of the uh, episode. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, quick, quick history refresh. John Brown uh, was a radical abolitionist who decided that he would take up arms and, okay. uh, you know, attack not only the government, but like uh, people in general that supported slavery. So he ended up, you know, going after innocent people and also the government itself. Um because he wanted to lead or at least start a massive slave rebellion across the South to end slavery. So he gets caught um, and brought in by uh, future Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Um, and this judge, who happened to be working at the Winchester Courthouse as well, was designated as the judge overseeing that. Um, the irony here is that later this judge himself would become a Confederate. Um and I say irony because John Brown was also waging, um, at least in part, a war against the federal government when he raided Harper's Ferry and was stealing military equipment to try to... Um, uh, equip the slaves and have a rebellion. Right. So, obviously, this judge and John Brown were on two opposite ends of slavery, etc. But the irony is that they both eventually were going against the federal government in one form. Yeah. Um, John Brown... But that was really cool. Yeah, here. John Brown. Right ideas and being an abolitionist, but going about it the wrong. Yeah, so um, I think that covers the museum tour. It was pretty good. Uh, it was really nice. We got to sit in oh, there. Yeah. Oh, and we got to go to sit where the judges would sit and see the perspective of sitting up there and hitting ham hammering the gavel. Yeah, that was fun. And they also on a, had a new exhibit on display. It was part of like the fence that used to be around That's the nice. uh, courthouse. And it, it like this particular section of fence had only been recently like rediscovered within the last like it was sometime. This year, because we went, we went back in, uh, like, late June, early July. Yeah, someone, yeah. it was at, like, a, I think it was at a bar. It was in someone's ba barn. Barn, okay. Yeah. Not a bar. Uh, yeah, they, like, they found it and were like, huh, this is, uh, seemingly a historic relic. So they were very kind and donated it. Yeah. Um, they actually had the newspaper article about it there, which yeah, was cool. Yeah, it was earlier this year. And they did have some, uh smaller displays in the courtroom itself that were like hey here's like what happened in the courtroom and kind of stuff like that yeah it was neat um so what do we want to talk about next in winchester mm, some more Jackson's headquarters since we're on a civil war theme okay yeah so one of the other places we went in chester was uh, a house that was used as stonewall jackson's headquarters um when he was in the shenandoah valley for a couple months during the civil war um it was really cool because a lot of the stuff that was um, in the house was, like, there when Stonewall Jackson was there. Um, right, and and um, I'll just jump in here. Cause okay. this is, uh, to explain why they have a lot of that stuff, the man that owned the house originally, who temporarily loaned it to Stonewall Jackson, I don't think he charged him anything because... Um, he was out of town for, I, I, I don't remember the reasoning, but he was out of town for a while and he was just like, Hey, like you need this. Like I'm a bit, he was like a huge fan of Stonewall Jackson and like good friends with the guy. Um, so he's like, Hey, like you can borrow my house. Like, you know, as long as you need it kind of deal, I'm going to be out for months anyways. I think it was some medical reasons or something. Um, but anyways, long story short, this guy was obsessed with Stonewall Jackson. So he went on a buying spree of anything and everything he could buy. That Stonewall Jackson had, or like if Stonewall Jackson left something and for some reason didn't want it back, um, primarily because he died during the war. But like hypothetically, if, if something was left there that his family didn't, want. Um, they didn't want, and like uh, yeah, his family didn't want, or like maybe he left it there during the course of the war before he died and someone had noticed it, but like he just didn't ask for it back. Like the guy would try to keep that kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Uh, the really cool thing was, like, of course, we have a lot of relics from Stonewall Jackson because this guy was so obsessed and was like, hey, I'm, I will buy that. I will, like, we have it here. We're keeping that kind of deal. Um, and it was also interesting because we we got to see in their, their museum there um, 
that his was it his second wife yeah second wife okay so his second wife had written memoirs of stonewall jackson um uh that were the other half of 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 jackson right because it was like you see the public persona you've seen him as a general like this is what he's like as the man when you put the general hat off and like he comes, you know, as as a man. Yeah. And another interesting thing was um, they noticed they noted that Stonewall Jackson was very humble, and so he despised being called Stonewall Jackson because he did not want any attention to himself. He all the statues of him show him as being like this burly guy who's like very much like, like look at me, look at me, you know. Me, and it's like, uh, no, Stonewall Jackson was not that kind of guy. He was very humble. He he would hate the limelight. He hated being called called Stonewall. So like. While it was meant as a term of respect, the soldiers would never say it when he was around, um, and he would never have clamored to be called that. Yeah. Um, um, the reason I know is it was his second wife that wrote the memoirs, because his first wife died in right. childbirth before the Civil War. The other interesting thing that they noticed uh, or noted was that he was very religious, and he would keep this prayer book with him at all times. And he'd ha- he even had a little desk where he would pray, his praying desk. Um, and they showed us some artwork... That was done of Stonewall Jackson, where uh, due to the artist's um, artistic liberties, thank you, artistic liberty, well, made some changes that would not be accurate to what would happen. So basically, it's the middle of winter; they're outside the house. I think it was actually supposed to be this house, but it could have been a different house. But the point is, they're outside of a house, and Stonewall Jackson has taken gear off of his horse and just dumped it on the floor, which. You know, you want, not the floor, excuse me, the yeah, ground outside. With and the, the snow, snow on it, and that would Which, ruin the saddle. Right, that doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't do that. But there was a key reason that they did that, mm-hmm. um, and that is that they showed his little prayer book being there um, in the pile of stuff that had been, been dumped out there as a way to acknowledge his such extreme um, dedication to prayer. Uh, the other interesting thing was they were saying that basically every depiction of Jackson's hair color is oh, is almost always wrong. Because if I remember right, it was supposed to be more reddish brown. It was reddish brown, and it's often depicted as having black hair. Right. But that comes from the, the fact that at the time all photos were like uh, in black and white, so showed his hair as like, dark. And that everyone just kind of assumed his hair was black. But, but that, was, that was an interesting, like, tidbit, right? Because, like, this vision that we have of the man is, is just wrong in terms of literally, like, the hair color, even. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was very interesting because he, he was a very strong leader. Um, but they were saying that, that the book that she wrote shows this much more passionate and, like, kind-hearted man that you don't typically think of when you think of Stonewall Jackson. You think of someone who's hard and aggressive um, and, like, commanding and, like, I'm taking over, we're doing this, no debate, like, kind of the guy, like, when I made a decision, I made a decision kind of deal, like, um, which is also true, but it's interesting to see that, like, his public persona as a general versus his private real self being so vastly different. Yeah. All right, where do we want to hop to next? Um... Washington's office. Okay. Yeah, so there was this um, small little two-room house in Winchester that, according to the family that um, lived in there for a couple hundred years before they sold it, uh, was used as Washington's surveying office when um, he was the surveyor for the area. There's no, like, written records to say that, oh, George Washington definitely used this building. But um, it's it was just or it's oral tradition, um, and there's some validity to there might be some validity to it because we do know he was in the area mm-hmm. surveying the um, property or surveying or what is now Winchester, so it's definitely possible. And they had some like really interesting just artifacts from just the area, a lot of like Native American um, artifacts and early like Winchester. Um, artifacts from um, the first um, like white settlers there, and also very uh, one other really cool thing was like they had like real surveyor tools from that time, and um, the interesting thing to me was that like these were at the time hand signed, like the tools would be 
inscribed with the creator's name itself. My assumption is that was either, um, I, I forget, they think it was a reason, but I would think, you know, like, one, it shows validity, like, this is made by Joe Smith Surveyor Tools, or whatever company it is, right? Yeah. Um, because at least in today's time, it's much easier to track things, but, like, back then, there's no way to really track it, so, like, that would be one way to be, like, hey, this was genuinely made by me, like, you know it's a genuine good tool. Um, and it's also cool because they did show they it was a pretty small display, but they had a lot of good information about like, hey, like here's what Washington did pre-Revolutionary War. Of course, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Revolutionary War and like post-Revolutionary War and stuff. But it was mostly on like, hey, here's what he did as a surveyor. Here's the time he was in the army for the British uh, Continental Army prior to deciding on um winning. prior to deciding or excuse me prior to any revolutionary ideas or revolutionary war yeah um and the, the funny part to me is that like he wasn't exactly having the most success as a military leader back then which is for a, a lot of reasons but like certainly i think looking at that record you wouldn't assume that he would go on to be some great general later um in his life but they noted that, like, yeah, but, like, also, like, um, while it, while he wasn't succeeding terribly much then, he probably learned a hell of a lot about, like, okay, that tactic didn't work. That strategy was a mess. Like, don't do that in this kind of combat situation, right? So, like, they were saying, their argument was, yeah, he didn't do terribly well here, but, like, he was a quick learner and a quick study. So, like, he quickly applied new lessons to the Revolutionary War, and that's what a one reason that attributed to him being yeah. a better general then. Um, okay, where are we going after when uh, Washington's office? Uh, the last place that we visited in Winchester, I think, was Abram's Delight, which is the oldest stone house in Winchester. Yeah, that was very interesting. So that was a, a home to Quakers. Originally, they were Quakers. Um, and then they left the Quaker church, and I don't really know if they had kept any other organized religion. Yeah, um, but it was very interesting because they they were very. What's the word I'm looking for? They weren't terribly showy in terms of like when we went around the rooms. It was like at least the way they had set it up, like that they think was set up. It wasn't super showy. They did have some very fine pieces of of china, etc. But like those were hidden behind like in shelves. But um, those were prominently displayed like they would put candles there to show like hey look at this good stuff we have but like the rest of the house itself wasn't really that fancy yeah. um one thing we noted on the first floor was this long bench and um they explained to us like okay this long bench is for when someone dies or you think they're dead you would lay them down here and kind of attend to their body you know and check and see if they're actually dead or not because at the time they don't have great technology they can't really tell what's going on with the body and, and plus um, there wasn't a doctor nearby right there weren't doctors readily available like we have today to just check in um and i can't remember which way you were supposed to face the body i think the head was supposed to be towards the door no i thought it was the feet that were supposed to be towards the door because like if you were like the person woke up they didn't want to get like just scare like scare the person wake up and see like all these people around him thinking that they were dead okay i think that's what it was I, I can't remember so i'll go with what you're saying but it was a it was a twofold reason the other reason they were saying that was um it had something to do with like superstition of like um if they came back they might like come back as or invite like spirits and ghosts and stuff yeah. so there's some stu superstition stuff there um if i remember right this was the house where that girl was super tall yeah, there were like two sisters. Like one was like four, four eight or four nine, mm -hmm. and the other sister was like six two. Right, and so we we went upstairs, and like they're explaining this, and they're like, okay, like look at this bed. Uh, these beds are like made for like probably someone of roughly average height today. Um, definitely not for someone over six feet tall. Like not even close. So like the one girl. Eh, this bed's fine you know uh the other girl probably like a good foot is going over the bed yeah um or or something around that like it, it was probably incredibly uncomfortable yeah. no idea how she slept now if i remember right and correct me if i'm wrong um but my memory says she actually got worked as pretending to be a man because women were just not allowed to do certain jobs but she's very tall she's quite strong uh for a woman 
so she could more easily pass as a man. And I believe she actually worked yeah. um, several jobs pretending to be a man. Yeah, she did. And then because they were not the most financially stable family, I believe didn't the men either like, were like too sickly or old or or had yeah. died. The brother, they had a brother. The brother was very like, was very sickly. Okay. And the dad died. So. Right. So they were not. They weren't doing great money money wise. Um. But, but they did have some really nice pieces in the house that yeah. were original. Yeah, but back to the bed. What this, this is something that we learned in the Stonewall Jackson, um, headquarters. There was one of the pieces there that was was um his, uh, bed. One of his beds had been used and. It was made for, so Stonewall Jackson was very tall, he was like six feet, about six feet, and he clearly could not fit in the bed, and the tour guide told us that what he would do is like, uh, like a, a common thing for people to do at the time was for, to like, kind of like sit up, because they, at the time they believed it was, um, like better for you to sleep that way. Better for your health, yeah. Um, so that, if I had to guess, it's probably what the super tall sister did. Mostly. Um. Um. That does remind me, actually, of, of another interesting tidbit about Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, um, is that he had a servant. I, I suppose that's the term. Um, it, was a, it was a young boy who would basically run back and forth for him with messages and stuff, but the kid had some kind of, like, leg disability um, or something. I can't remember what exactly it was. But he, he had, like, a special made little, like, stool that the, the kid could bring with him and sit down on. Um, in order to help him with that, which yeah. I thought was very interesting, because again, when you read about like wars and generals, you kind of generally get a gist of like, okay, like militarily, how is this guy? Like, is he a strategic genius? Is he tactically genius? Is he bad at everything? Is he maybe he's just really good at logistics, but like very bad at like military strategy? So like, yeah. you know, he he got promoted to a position he shouldn't have been in. You don't really tend to hear about, like, privately what was the general like. Like, how did he treat his troops? You kind of generally more hear about, like, this guy was a bad general. Like, he didn't know what he was doing, like, strategically or, like, he couldn't think tactically or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting to hear, like, the more human side, in a sense, um, of Stonewall Jackson. Yeah, and that reminds me, the family that originally owned the house that Stonewall Jackson stayed in, I forget their name at the moment, but um, our tour guide kept using the word servant and someone was like were they slaves or were they servants and the person was like oh they were uh like actual like pay servants and stuff um and i i thought that i just kind of assumed like the implication was that they were slaves because like a lot of the times that i've heard people use the word servants when it comes to like families from the south that they were actually like slaves um but i thought it was like really interesting that this like family lived in the South and the Winchester were, um, Winchester was majority Confederate. Like, actually had, like, paid servants rather than slaves. I thought that was cool. Yeah, it was very nice that they were, they were, they didn't take insult that someone asked them that. Like, yeah. No, that's a good question, right? Yeah. Like, you should always clarify. Um, but they were very, they wanted to be very precise in their wording. That's why they used servants instead of slave. Because, like, no, it wasn't a slave because this person was free and this person was paid, like, this was legitimately a servant, right? Like, yeah. It was, it was almost kind of like you would say like a butler almost. Uh, not exactly one-on-one in, in terms of what they were doing, but like the idea is that like they have a job. Yeah. This is not this is not forced yeah. labor or a anything lot, like that. A lot of slaves were butlers. Not a lot, but there were some slaves that were butlers too. So. Right, but my but point is like this was a job. This was not forced labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was interesting. I, I really appreciate that. I think all of these places, like the tour guides, the volunteers, all of them are really phenomenally involved in, in terms of answering questions and, like, giving us really detailed, like, looks at everything, which was really nice. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about? Not in Winchester. Okay, so let's move on. Oh, there, we, there was this, what was the ice cream place that we went to? I don't know the name. Oh, there's this really good ice cream place right by the Shenandoah Valley Civil War Museum. Like the Fox or something like that. It's just this really good ice cream. I just love that ice cream. They also had a really good tuna salad sandwich. And no, it was, it was chicken salad, I think, actually. It was, it was quite delicious. Yes, and they I had a very good hot dog. They were, yeah, they were really good. Was, so, to give some pers- or context, there's like a little walking mall, essentially. Um, it's not inside, it's all outside, but like... 
you you walk down the path and if uh so they had the uh they had the courthouse museum shandoa valley civil war museum i think is the title and if you keep walking there's a whole bunch of shops there's all kinds of different stuff there's uh yeah. but like there's a whole area of like food places uh, as well as if you keep walking it was, it was a good distance i mean it was a good night it was a nice walk um yeah we just popped our head into one because we were like okay we're hungry it's gonna be a couple hour drive back not a couple hour maybe like an hour and a half yeah it's it's been an hour from our house to winchester depending on traffic though because i think yeah. we were leaving later in the day um yeah so i think it was like an hour and a half at that point and we were just like, eh, like uh, i thought it was an hour but i don't think that day it was i think the traffic was a little higher i thought that was a different day there was traffic okay okay um but yeah so yeah the trips to winchester were a lot of fun yeah the food was really good it was nice because there are a lot of food shops there um so we had like good variety to pick from but we just yeah. thought like that one caught our eye because we wanted ice cream specifically yes and they also sold ice cream milkshakes yes i think i got a milkshake yes i got. Like, i had a vanilla milkshake vanilla is my favorite ice cream flavor i had a scoop of, or two scoops of puppy ice cream yeah, it was really good. And it was also very, very hot, so, like, ice cream was a high on our minds. It was like, let's cool down, and it's a nice treat. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, like, uh, we probably spent at least a couple hours that day looking at different places. Yeah. Um, there were also some outdoor musicians, which was cool, but, you know. Yeah, one was sitting in Johnny Cash. Yeah. So, we have anything else we want to talk about this time? Uh, all... Manassas. Okay. Take it away. Yeah, so for July 4th, we went to the Manassas Battlefield, where we saw a huge statue of Stonewall Jackson on his horse. Um, and yeah, we got there early, so we checked the statue out, because the statue was outside, and then we wandered around, or wandered inside. They have this really cool exhibit, like, showing the, you know, like, it's, it's a, obviously a scaled-down version of um, the map that where the, of all the big battle sites for or sites for both battles um and then we wandered outside and um went on like a walking tour uh we went to there was like a wooden house where the only civilian casualty of the first Man uh, manassas battle um died she was an older old lady that stayed in her house and she died but the other there were some other people in the house and they they survived and then we went to a um stone house uh that used to be a i think it was a, like a pub mm -hmm. at one point and uh we checked it out and there were some uh graffiti on the walls of people's names which was cool yeah and they had i believe it was a red flag hanging out the window which was to indicate that this would be a uh temporary hospital basically like an impromptu hospital yeah where they would store soldiers literally as many as you could fit in the building yeah um until they could be transferred to a hospital or just died um and i believe it was the stone house that they were saying the cannibals wouldn't hit it but they would go above the house because it was in a valley yeah. um given yeah given the trajectory of of where the battlefield was yeah. relative to the house it would the cannibals would literally go above the house and like past it but like it didn't take any structural damage from from being yeah, hit. Yeah, and uh, they're not. I asked the uh, so it's a national park service site. I asked the national park or the park ranger if there was anybody in the house, and she said no. The, she said they didn't know, so she's like, yeah, we can't. We don't. We don't know. Which is totally fine. So yeah, it was a nice walking area. Um, you can just walk around the battlefield. They give pamphlets out that have detailed like self tours. They do tours as well um they also had a little interactive display where you can go in and you, you press the button and it has little lights that light up and show like basically how the battle progressed um throughout the days yeah. um and why it went the way it went kind of deal and yeah. then you can wander around the little exhibit and has um uniforms. replica uniforms and such and then i think a couple of the items there were actually genuine articles but some most of it was like this is a replica of what it would look like kind of deal. Yeah. Um, it was really nicely designed. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and you bought a walking stick. Yes. Um, I bought a walking stick because I thought 
it'd be nice to have one, you know, I mean, especially on longer walks, like, and sometimes rough terrain, and, you know, it's nice to have something to steady yourself with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was very nice, um, really nice view, you know, you can really see a good distance around. Yeah. And they also had cannons out that you're not supposed to touch, of course, um, to show, like, this is where the Union cannons were, this is where the Confederate cannons were, like, you can literally see both sides and it's like this is kind of crazy that like you're like if you were to put yourselves in their shoes like you can literally see the people that are probably going to kill you in this battle or the people you're killing in this battle like obviously once the smoke starts coming it's going to be a little harder to see and all that but it was very interesting to see where they were set up yeah um and yeah so yeah it was cool um you had never been i think i can't remember i might have been but it would have been years ago okay i've been a couple times yeah. I went in my elementary school, and then I went once at college. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you got anything else? Mm, oh, so one time we went to the uh, LDS, the Mormon, aka the Mormon Temple, off the Beltway. Yeah. Which was interesting. That was fun. Yeah. Um, they had an open house. It was the first time it was open to the public in like 40 years. 40, 50 or something like that. And so, yeah, we went inside and, um, yeah, we got to see, like, all the, all the rooms for their, like, religious ceremonies and stuff, which was cool. Because I, I was like, I don't want to go. Yeah. This is like, when a little kid me was convinced Cinderella lived there. Obviously, Cinderella does not live there, but I really wanted to go. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And they they had people posted to help like answer any questions you might have had. Yeah. And also explain what certain rooms were because they had like little signs that were like this room is for you know, um, this room is for specifically for baptisms or like this room is specifically where you would go to get married. Yeah. Right. That kind of deal. And, um. But they had people there too. Like, okay, if there's any questions or like, um, maybe you saw something and your it just sparked your imagination. You're wondering why that's there you know yeah they were very nice it was a interesting experience well yeah well well run um yeah it was very yeah. nice because they had it was very well coordinated in terms of like okay like this is the very clear line that you follow like and then you loop around here and then you go up these they're like right it was very nicely coordinated yeah and there were um so there was one thing that i found interesting was the they had like a waiting room for like the bride and her her uh people before the weddings, and I, w I was like, oh, I wonder where the groom and his people hang out before the wedding. And I asked one of the guys that was volunteering, and apparently there is no room for them. Like, there is no male equivalent, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Alright, I think that about wraps up all the tales we have. Okay. Unless you had anything else? I don't think so. Yeah, I think I think they covered everything in Winchester and Manassas, uh, at least for now. Yeah. Until next time, more journeys await. Yes. And yeah, we will uh, we'll be back as things Eventually. come up. Actually, yeah. Yeah, and um, once we start, uh, we can also upload our Bible studies together. Yeah. Um, we're gonna do it a little differently than than a typical Bible study. Um, our idea is to uh, take the advice of a priest from our local parish and. Probably should be the best. Yeah, Father Kirby, and um, his advice was one one good thing to do as a Bible study, especially if you're trying, if you're struggling to uh, consistently do it, which, you know, some people are, some people aren't, but um, one thing to do that's really good to do as a couple, especially uh, with husband and wife, is because, uh, because, you know, we have readings every Sunday, one thing that's really good to do is sit down prior to that Sunday and go through the readings and kind of pray for guidance and, and reflect on them. And so we can do that as a, a, a couple and kind mm -hmm. of understand like, okay, what are the readings trying to get to us this week? And then when we're sitting in church on Sunday, we'll be that much more engaged because we're like, hey, yeah, I remember reading that this week. And I remember talking about that. Let's see what the priest has to say in his homily. Like, um, and maybe we'll get a different angle than he does, uh, yeah. which is which is good too, because you can learn a lot that way. Yeah. So I think yeah. we'll, we'll upload those as mm -hmm. they come. Um, not not 100% sure when what time we'll, we'll start doing that, but um, that's something that we want to do in the future. Yeah. All right, till next time. Bye.
ಆರ್ ಹಿ